So Annalise, you can um, start. Annalise from uh, WooClub will uh, switch to English. Exactly. Um, I will share my screen. Yeah, share your screen. And uh, so we have another 15 minutes presentation and then we'll go to the break. So Perfect. Yeah. That is perfect. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for having me today. And before I dive into, uh, let's say, the, the content of this presentation inside your student's brain, I have uh, three disclaimers to share with you first. And the first is that you will be using your smartphones in this session, so keep them handy if they're not already. And you will also see a lot of brain images in the presentation. And I'm going to reference a lot of scientific studies about the brain. But I am not a brain specialist myself. I'm not a neuroscientist either. But at WooClap, we do work with these specialists in order to build our, our platform, of course. And a third disclaimer is that there will be a link in the chat uh, during, during my talks. And you can use that to show your interest if you'd like to pilot WooClap. And we'll be in touch with you after this conference. So please. And I hope that you all see my screen. I'm going to enlarge it a little bit to make it more efficient for you. So you can uh, scan the QR code with your smartphones or, and I'm trying to find the chat here in order to post the link. So if people want to join through this link, you can, and then you'll be using your browser, of course. So I see that already people are connecting. This is also where you're going to have the indication of your students connecting if you are using WooClap. And don't worry if we're going to uh, go forward with the first question, you will also be able to always join through the link that you will see on the above screen. So let's take a look. How would you describe students today? And I'm going to reset this timer here. And I'm going to show you how the word cloud is, is taken. And then Liz, we, some Liz, we can hear you. Cannot hear you. Release. Still can't hear you. Still can't hear you. No. Okay. And this, can you try again? We cannot hear you some for some reason. Yes. Okay. Now we can hear you. Good. Okay. So I think that it might be do something with my internet connection. I hope you can hear me. And yes. if not, please indicate. So you see that we have a good word cloud here going on and we see that uh, our students, they can be described in one word and this is, this is also how we feel about them. So this is really a type of question that you can use during ice breaking uh, for the beginning of a lesson to see what is really living with, uh, within your audience. But let's start with our presentation. And when I was a student, I did not pay much attention to the way I was studying for my tests. I was using a methodology which is, to this date, the only one that is largely used by students, which is rereading and highlighting. And also, occasionally, I was cramming. I don't know if that sounds familiar to some of you here in the audience. I was certainly guilty of that. But I had good grades most of the time, so I was confident that I was doing the right thing and that I was learning efficiently. But guess what? I was wrong and my methodology and my color coding skills were in fact not effective at all. And later on, I actually found out that those techniques were studied by a group of researchers in 2013, Janilowski, Rawson and others in a paper called Improving Student Achievement. And more specifically, the ones, the methodologies that I was using and that most of the students are still using were actually proven to be of low utility in terms of learning. 
So why is that? Because they are in fact very passive approaches and they tend to not activate our brain and our neurons. So let's go back to, to our brain and the actual process of learning, because when you learn something new, you change. And more specifically, in order to learn something new, your brain needs to change. And the brain can change at any age. And this is, of course, called neuroplasticity. So when we acquire new knowledge, neurons become more strongly connected, which creates a stronger network and allows the neurons to communicate with each other faster and more efficiently. Meaning that if you want to learn something new, you need to create neural pathways. And researchers like to compare this process that is happening in our brains to a forest. So let's take a walk with me. In a dense forest, to go from point A to point B and being able to create a path, you have to go through the branches, through the weeds, multiple times over and over again. And first you will create a trail, but the more you walk through that trail, the wider it's going to be. And eventually, if you keep walking and working, this trail will turn into a paved forest road, for example, with stairs, as you can see on the slide. And this is exactly the same with neuron pathways. The more you activate groups of neurons, the stronger the connection and the network. So in our brain, to create those connections, we need to activate and stimulate the groups of neurons that are associated with what you want to learn simultaneously and repeatedly. And quickly, if you stop walking the path for a while, nature will take over. And this again is the same with our brain. It's called forgetting. So I guess this is where my mathematics <laughs> from high school are now deeply covered in weeds. But you can see that the techniques I was using as a student were in fact very, very passive. And at Wook Lab, we work with higher education teachers and professional instructors. So we thought by giving them insights on how their students will learn best, they can adapt the way they're teaching them. And based on research, we actually uncovered three effective and very interesting techniques to study efficiently. And this is what I'm going to share next. So the three strategies, the three techniques are practicing brain activation, spacing study periods, and having a growth mindset. So the belief that one can become better. And let's take a look at the first one. Let's take a deeper look into activating your brain. So how do we foster brain activation? In this study by Zeram and Rodinger in 2010, three groups of students were asked to prepare, prepare for a test using three different techniques. You see that group A had four study periods and by study, we really mean rereading and highlighting, etc. And they had four test trials. And by the test, we really mean mock exams or practice the recovery of the material they, they studied. And group B, they had six periods of study and only two test trials. And group C had eight study trials and no test trials. So we actually see that answering questions is much more effective than periods of study. The more active way to learn is to practice tests. So when you try to remember the content, actually. In most educational situations, both teachers and students make a sharp distinction between learning and assessment. And learning occurs when students read their textbooks, listen to lectures, when they take notes, when they review their books and notes. And students' learning is assessed from time to time by the requirement to take quizzes and tests and exams. And teachers and students actually think these are like dipsticks just dropped into the student's head every so often to measure what they have learned, but without having any effect on the process of learning itself. But in this case, the brain was activated. So let's check why this is more effective. In this other study by Vestergren and others in 2014, the similar experiment was run, meaning students studying and students practicing testing or answering questions, and they took brain scans of the students, where we actually see that two regions are more activated when we try to answer questions. 
And those regions are key to learning and memorizing. And it's a sign that people are really encoding information and knowledge into their brain. So let's see if you have been able to, to, to listen closely, which part of the brain do you activate to learn and which part do you activate to, to memorize? I'm going to reset the timer to give you some more time. So if you see that you're still connected, just do a refresh on your WooClap connection and you can answer the question. I see that we already have one of the 38 two that there's to answer and I can bias you a little bit with the most frequent answers <laughs> and you see that some of you are still doubting and this is really a way to work with your students also when you have an important concept that you've just seen just ask a question to see if they really comprehend it all right Five seconds, four seconds to go. When the timer stops, the voting stops and I can show you the correct answer. And luckily, most of you were right. Good. So how do you practice that brain activation? First, by practice recalling the study material. Secondly, by repeating tests and exercises. Three, preparing questions and practice answering those questions and let them study with a classmate, of course. All right, we're at our second strategy we're going to dive into, the spacing of study periods. So it's basically having a study schedule spread out on several days. And let's take three students here in this example. They will spend four hours to study a certain topic, where the first one is going to study for four hours and the day before the exam. So this is really cramming or mass studying. The second one is studying four days before the exam, one hour a day, as you can see in the schedule. So this is more spaced out. And the third one will study for 30 minutes, but over a span of eight days. And let's see how taking breaks is beneficial. We have more brain activation. And this experience by Callan and others in 2012, they asked two groups of students to study English vocabulary lists. And we see that episodes one to four represent a study periods for both groups. And the analysis over the combined episodes from two to four shows significant activity in the key regions of the brain, only for the space, but not for the mass condition. And this is not a good thing to see a decrease in brain activity. It means that the neurons are not connected and are not consolidating information. So less activation and less consolidation. A second benefit is that when you take breaks, when you sleep, your brain will silently continue to work for you. Most of the memory consolidation or brains undergo happens at night. And the retention of newly learned study material can be enhanced simply by taking a nap after a session. And in this experiment on the slide by Anthony and others in 2012, two groups of students were told to learn to play a piano melody with the left hand. One group took a nap, the other one did not, and they both took a test afterwards. And of course, no surprises here, they performed better than the group that did not take a nap. And what's fascinating, is that during their sleep, the sleep spindles values, thus the brain activity, were largest over the cortical regions, contralateral to the hand that was used to perform the melodies. All right, a third benefit to space your study periods is that you learn more and you forget less. In the Cornell experiment in 2009, we had two groups of students that were compared. On the x-axis, you have the condition, so masks versus spaced, and on the y-axis, you have the proportion of information the students were able to recall when they took a test and the materials were over 40 synonyms. So those kinds of experiments just validate the forgetting curve that was theorized by Herman Ebbinghaus in the 19th century. 
And the forgetting curve is actually a mathematical formula that describes the rate at which something is forgotten after it has been initially learned. So the idea is over 100 years old. The downward slope of the forgetting curve can be softened by repeating the learned information at particular intervals. And this curve shows how information is lost over time when there is no attempt to retain it, of course. So now let's see how we need to practice the spaced study technique. One, study more often, but for shorter periods of time. Two, do not cram at all. Three, sleep, just take naps. And four, have a study schedule. All right. Finally, the third technique we're going to go over is having the belief that someone can improve, having a growth mindset, really the opposite of having a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset will say that I'm either good at it or not, or I can either do it or I don't. Whereas a growth mindset will think in terms of, hey, if I fail, I really see an opportunity to grow. So my effort and my attitude is determining my abilities and the challenges I am able to overcome will help me grow. And it's like Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. And thinking like this has definitely consequences in your brain. Your mind is very, very powerful. And in this experiment here by Moser and others conducted in 2010, two groups of people were supposed to identify the middle letter of a five letter series. Sometimes the middle letter was the same as the other four and sometimes it was different. It's pretty simple doing the same thing over and over, but the mind cannot help it. It just kind of zones out from time to time. And that is when people make mistakes and they notice it immediately. And then of course they feel, they feel stupid. So when someone makes a mistake, the brain makes two quick signals. The first is an initial response that indicates something has gone wrong. And a second signal that indicates the person has consciously is aware of it, of the mistake and is trying to right the wrong. And actually both of those single signals occur within a quarter of a second of the mistake that have been made. So people who really think um, they can learn from their mistakes uh, did really better after making that mistake. So in other words, they successfully bounced back after an error. Their brain also reacted differently, producing a bigger second signal. The one that says, well, I see that I've made a mistake, so I should probably pay more attention. And again, there is more activation in the brain. So a little recap here on how we are able to believe that we can improve. Uh, more motivation, the awareness that you can improve yourself. Having more perseverance using words like yet, I'm not quite there just yet, and having those praising efforts. Okay, let's see. Now that we've seen the three strategies to use effectively, can you recall them? So if you're not connected anymore, please refresh your browsers or your, um, on your smartphone, the browsers of, on your smartphone, and you will be able to respond to our question. So what are the three strategies to study efficiently? And I hope you are still with me. All right, we have one vote, we have two votes. Yes, space study, nap, don't cram, testing, space, exactly. And you see that we can put likes on answers. So you see that your peers and the students in your audience, for example, can also use that. Testing, space retrieval, growth mindset. All right. Practice your brain activation, space your study periods, and have a growth mindset. So this is how to study efficiently, of course. And we're nearly at the end of the presentation. And I'd like you to know that with WooClap, you can teach differently. 
you can check the level of knowledge at the end of your course or at the beginning of your course. You can return regularly to important concepts. You can, of course, question your students to activate their brains and, of course, motivate students and show they are progressing. And please be advised that we integrate with Moodle, so you can integrate scoring with your gradebooks and open WooClap within your Moodle course. And next to WooClap, we have uh, our platform WooFlash, which is really based on space repetition, self-evaluation and feedback to really follow up on your students' progress. And this platform also integrates with Moodle and with WooClap, even to synchronize your questions. Okay, and I'm going to put a link in the chat so you know where to turn to if you'd like to pilot WooClap. And you'll see there's a shortened link. And the only thing for me is to thank you for your attention. Please uh, be advised that if you'd like to have some more information to pass by Illy and we will be happy to inform you. Thank you very much.